So wonderful having you all here this morning. The base of my message is from the Gospel of John that was just read to you. These words, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, you don't have to raise your hands, but do any of you partake in or have bought into something like Ancestry.com or My Family and Me or maybe 23andMe, do you know what I'm referring to? That maybe you could have your DNA tested and you could find out where your roots came from? There's a growing trend in America that if I find out where I come from, I have a deeper understanding of my family and maybe who I am. And maybe I'll have a resense to... Uh, a sense of purpose and hope for my life. If I understand who I am and where I came from, and if I'm tied more to the past, I'll have a better present and I'll point more toward the future. Now, I had this unique experience happen to me when I was in high school. Uh, I am my father's son. I bear his name. And between my junior and senior years in high school, and you've heard this from me before, that I traveled to Germany for a month to visit with my family. Now, we were separated by thousands of miles and uh, spoke different languages, and we never seen each other before. I saw my grandmother, but for the most part, never seen my family before. The only thing that they knew about me was that I was my father's what? Son. So when I got off the plane, I was treated as such. I was Kurt, my father, Werner's son. This is his son, and he bears the same last name as Muse. And it's sort of unique when people get teary-eyed, even though they haven't seen you before. What, what type of love there was there. But there was, there was a past uh, to, to go with my name and who I was. And even though we never met each other, there is a sense of who I am simply because of my family history. I want you to keep that in mind. Now, in, in modern-day America, um, we have many different ways for how we name our children. Now, of course, our children bear our last name, but we have different reasons for naming our children by their first or last name. You don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you are named after another family member? I talked to a, a yeah, some of us are named after a, a, a family member or a loved one. I had a person who's, whose parents were from Scotland, and they said for, for hundreds of years, they simply named every generation by flipping the first and middle name. And that's how you can tell which generation. They did that for hundreds of years. The first son, they always flipped the first and the last name. Now, for some of us, maybe we name our children after, I don't know, movie stars or music stars. But some people will name their children um, in honor of their family, maybe a family member who recently died. Now, family names originally weren't given in random, but they pointed to who we were and what we did. Our names reflect our past. Now, if you wanted to, you can buy a book and that will research the history of your family names or your name. Have you ever done that? Do you know what your first, middle, and last name means? Because it does have a meaning. So, for example... If you are a smith, chances are that your family worked in iron. If you're a Snyder or Schneider, your family was into sewing or clothing. Also, your first name tells something about yourself. If you are a Dorothy, a Jonathan, a Theodore, a Matthew, your name means a gift from God. Of course, Christina, Chris, Kristen, Christopher refer to who? Christ. Even familiar biblical names have meanings like Eve, the giver of life, or Isaac, the Lord's salvation, or Mark, any marks out there, means shining, or Joseph means increase. Our names reflect many times what our family did in the past or something specific about our name. In many ways, our name and its reputation precedes us. Now, don't laugh. What about Muse? Well, Muse were the people who took care of the animals in the royal king's courts. I don't know, okay? Just don't say I dealt with manure, okay? Anyways, okay. So as Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Christ. Now, who is Christ? Well, what's his name? He is the Messiah, the Anointed One. Now, for the past month, we've been talking to Advent about fathers and sons, correct? We had Adam and his son Cain and Abel. Do you remember what Cain did? Yes. Okay, and then we had Abraham and his half-son. Well, Abraham is sort of his false son, Ishmael came from Hagar and his real son, Isaac. Okay? And then we had David and Absalom, and we had Saul, and we also had Jonathan. And so today we celebrate the birth of Christ. So it's appropriate for us to celebrate the birth of God's Son. So we say what? Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. 
Now, for Israel, if I mention the name David, uh, David, uh, the name David is loaded. Uh, the national flag of Israel is over, is the star of David. David is the king who brought prominence to Israel. David means beloved. David is synonymous with Israel. But this Christmas morn, we focus on the birth of God's son. Hence, St. John writes, the word, made, the word was made flesh and is dwelling among us, and we beheld his glory. Now, this, this morning, this glorious morning, we celebrate the birth of God's Son in the flesh. Yet 17 times, not just one, but 17 times in the New Testament, Jesus is called the Son of David. In many ways, David's kingship, his name, precedes Jesus and everything about it. The Son of David shares, in many ways, the spiritual DNA of Jesus. The family history and title of promise of David is there with Christ. St. Paul summarizes the entire Christian belief in the book of Romans. If you haven't read the book of Romans, it's a whole doctrinal book of the whole Christian content of Christian doctrine. And he says this about Jesus, the son of David. God's promise given by prophets beforehand in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who has his human nature, was a descendant of David. Even St. Paul sees Jesus as the son of who? David. Now, we talked about this before, and you, you saw two nativity scenes. Uh, one that I've used for years for children's message that the kids go find, and other ones are beautiful like this. But there's something going on among um, Lutheran churches and schools, and maybe we should do this. And that's like the last day of school for a Lutheran school, and maybe going into uh, the Christmas celebration. People will bring in their nativity sets. There's maybe a hundred of them, and they'll set up their favorite nativity set, and the children get to walk by and see the various art of it. Maybe that's something we could do, maybe in the gym. Set up eight tables, just have them circle all the nativity sets, and the children get to see the variety of art and the various displays that are there. And of course, no nativity is set is complete, just like in my children's message, unless who is there? Jesus, who is the son of who? David. We call it Son of David Day. Just think about that. You can see all different nativity sets, but once again, it's not complete unless the son of David is there. And so when we talk about Jesus being the son of David, he really is the fulfillment of prophecy. All the Old Testament speaks about the coming of Jesus. If, if, if you're going to open up the Bible and read about all the prophecies of the Messiah, and if I was going to have you get an easel with a big paint board and a, and, and a paintbrush and a number of different colors, you'd paint a picture of Jesus. The history of the Messiah precedes Jesus coming in the flesh. Have you ever had to wait long for something? Well, the Jews waited centuries for the son of David to come to fulfill his mission. And Jesus is that Messiah. Every single Jew knew that Jesus was coming. They are waiting for the son of David. That promise began with Adam and Eve, remember? He will bruise your heel, but you will crush his what? head. And Abraham was told to look out at the stars and promise that the number of descendants you'll have will be as many stars in the sky or the sands on the seashore. And who will come from him? Someone who will bless all nations, Jesus. And then finally, it comes to 1 Samuel 7. Let me read this to you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I'll establish his kingdom. So when David becomes king, He's establishing a kingdom that will last for what? Forever. Now, you don't have to admit it, but my kids got into, it was like, there's this popular TV series on HBO, what, the Kingdom of Thrones? What's it called? The Game of Thrones? I know people are sort of into that today. Now, I, I was never really into Harry Potter. I mean, my, my kids and my wife really got into it, but I never really got into it. And so a couple years ago, uh, uh, we vacationed went to Universal. I never knew much about Harry Potter until my daughter took me between these two brick walls at Universal Studios, and there I entered into Harry Potter Village as if I was transformed into the movie set. But I didn't know that, that when the children went to school there, they became a member of a house. And, and so there's various houses that they went to, and, and they sort of learned there, and that's where they had their whole education. And for their whole life, they were a member of the house. If you walked down our hallway... Right across from the school office, there's names of all our children in our school, and they all belong to a different house, a biblical person. You see, we belong to King David's house. That is Jesus' house. We're part of his kingdom. So when 
King David is born, his kingdom will last forever. Uh, Listen to what the psalmist cries out. So I will establish his descendants forever and ever, and his thrones on the days of heaven. And Jeremiah says this, the prophet, the, the weeping prophet Jeremiah, whose life stinks, but he has to go on with it anyways, Jeremiah says this, David's house shall never lack a man to sit on the throne, and that is Jesus. So the son of David, Jesus, sits on the throne of King David for how long? Forever. We have a king who lasts forever. What a blessing that is. So really, when we say Merry Christmas, you know what we're saying? Look at the son of David. He's a son of David who was promised from Adam and Eve to be our Savior. And when you see him, he's a fulfillment of everything that the Messiah is. He's the anointed one. And when you say Merry Christmas, you're saying, do you see that son of David? He's a king whose kingdom and whose reign lasts for how long? Forever. That's what we're really saying. We're saying Merry Christmas. And for us believers, we see a Merry Christmas. We know there's more to this story. There's a whole lot of backstory to it. Well, what do we know? Well, we know that we're baptized into Christ, that we receive his body and blood, and we're promised the gift of heaven. So Son of David, in many ways, is just a title. But there's a whole world of wealth and blessings that come to us when we say, Merry Christmas, Jesus, the Son of David. Now, let's talk about what the Son of David does. So when a mother of a sick child prayed, and her daughter was ill and demon-possessed, you know what she prayed? Son of David, have mercy on us. And two blind men heard that Jesus was walking by. You know what they said? Have mercy on us, son of who? David. And when Jesus healed a mute son, the astonished crowd said, Could this be the what? The son of David. And as Messiah entered into Jerusalem, remember the palm branches? What did the crowd say? Hosanna to the son of who? David. And St. Timothy writes, and he calls us to remember this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from who? David. So this Christmas, this Advent, we've been talking about fathers and sons. God the Father and his Son. The Son who? Jesus, the Anointed One, the Promised. The Son of David who reigns and rules and redeems to forgive you and I. And I like this best when I talk about father-son's relationships. What it means that Jesus is the Son of David for us. You know it. You can say it with me. For God so loved, say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall shall not die, but have eternal life. Merry Merry Christmas. And through the son of David in faith, we are God's children and part of that kingdom forever. And all God's people say?